I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And today I want to preach Romans 8 and verse 28. The title of the message is, The Great Promise. And this verse is just a glorious verse. And I want us to drink in this verse, and I want us to be encouraged, I want us to be edified, I want us to be strengthened this day, and who is to say but how those of us this morning will need this verse in the upcoming week in ways beyond which we are even previously made aware. How this will be a deposit into your spiritual life that God will use to prepare you for what lies around the corner that we are unaware of even today. I want to begin by reading this verse. I dare say that all of us could just quote this verse by memory, and we could just go straight into its exposition, but allow me to read it one more time from our Bible. Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. It was the great Bible teacher, James Montgomery Boyce, who said, if the Bible is a ring, then the book of Romans must surely be the diamond on this ring. And if that is so, it could be argued that Romans chapter 8, Boyce said, is the apex cut of that diamond upon the ring. And if that be true, then Romans 8.28 is surely the tip of that apex cut of that diamond upon the ring. By this, Boyce was arguing that this portion of Scripture is the choicest, perhaps, in all of the Word of God. He took an entire year to preach through simply this one chapter. Uh, this verse has been likened to a pillow on which we rest our weary heads during the darkest nights of our soul. It is here that we rest our head and we find comfort and we find security in the overriding purposes of our sovereign God. Upon this verse, believers in every place and in every generation have found the strength that they need for their troubled hearts. John MacArthur writes, quote, For Christians, this verse contains perhaps the most glorious promise in Scripture. It is breathtaking in its magnitude, encompassing absolutely everything that pertains to a believer's life. Close quote. Now, there is nothing that lies outside the parameters of this verse. This verse puts its arms entirely around us and entirely around everything that ever transpires in our lives and assures us that God is at work and God is causing it all to work together for good. Could there be a greater promise today? other than heaven itself, it is, uh, it is truly impossible to exaggerate or to overestimate the height and depth and breadth and length of, of this verse. Uh, Boyce calls this verse, quote, one of the most comforting texts in the entire Word of God, quote. And elsewhere he calls it, quote, that tremendous text, close quote. I believe that there is not a one of us here today, today who would disagree with this assessment. This is indeed a tremendous text. It is a Mount Everest of truth that we must scale today from its mountaintop. We have the eternal perspective, and we can see what we do not see in the valley of life. We see from the top of this text as God sees. We see what God is doing in our lives. Every one of us here today needs to drink fully from the deep well of this text, which is bubbling up with living water. Here is comfort for every discouraged heart here today. Here is strength for every wavering soul here today. Here is hope for those 
who are discouraged and who are beaten down by the trials of life. Here are the loving arms of God reaching around us and lifting us up and bringing us assurance that every moment of every day, God is at work. And God is causing all things to work together for our good. Here is an anchor for our soul when we find ourselves adrift in the storms of life. Now, as we look at this verse, it's just one verse, but our time will be more than occupied today to plumb its depths and ascend to its heights. But I want you to note four things with me as we look at this text. I, I want to lay out the, uh, the, the road map. I want you to note with me the great certainty, and we know. I want you to see the great activity that God causes all things to work together for good. And I want you to see the great purpose, which is for good. And finally, the great calling to those who love Him who are called according to His purpose. All right, let's delve in. Let's jump in to the wonderful waters of this text. I want you to note first the great certainty. Notice how this verse begins. It begins with a dramatic statement of emphatic conviction. And this verse begins with these three words, and we know. Every one of us here today need to be able to say with Paul, and I know. Please note this does not say, and we feel, as though we are led by our feelings. Nor does this say, and we understand why. As though we have God's insight into the why of things that unfold in our lives. And nor does this say, and we hope, as though we should be living by some kind of wishful thinking. No, this does not say, and we feel, nor the, and we understand why, nor, and we hope. This says, and we know. Every one of us here today must have this deep inner conviction, this deep inner certainty. This is the anchor point for our Christian lives during our pilgrimage here upon the earth. Now, our circumstances may lead us to think otherwise, and our feelings may cause us to assume otherwise. But our lives must be led by something far deeper and something far more stable than reading our circumstances or by going by mere emotional feelings. We must live with a deep sense of conviction based upon what this glorious passage says. And we know. Please note the word we. It's in the plural, which includes every Christian, every believer. This is not just something for Paul, the theologian and the apostle, to know. And this is not just something for some believers to, to grasp. When Paul says, we, and we know, he is saying that every one of us here today should have this deep, settled conviction. And if, we don't, if we're not able to say, and we know, we are going to drown in the Christian life. We are going to be so filled with discouragement at times and disillusionment that will lead to a sense of, of, of defeat in our own spiritual lives that we will be of little good for the Lord here upon the earth. We must be able to say, and we know. Do not ever let discouragement cause you to doubt the truth of this verse. Do not ever allow disillusionment to ever shake you loose from this core conviction, and we know. If we are to live by faith and not by sight, if we are to live by faith and not by feelings, if we are to live by faith and not by the outward appearance of our circumstances, we must have this great certainty or we are going under. 
That's number one, the great certainty. Do you have this great certainty? Can you say with the Apostle Paul today, and I know this? Well, this leads to the great activity. And I want to set it before you. Notice the next words in this glorious passage. That God causes all things to work together for good. What a glorious statement of the great activity of God in and through and over our lives. Let me begin by saying what this verse does not say. Let's begin at that point. This does not say that all things are good. This is not putting a, a spiritual spin on the ball that says all things are good. This does not say that. Sin is not good. Evil is not good. The devil is not good. There's plenty in this world that is not good. It could be argued there's more evil and more bad than there is good in this world. Neither does this say that God causes all things. And to be sure, God is not the author of sin. God is not the author nor the participant of evil. This does not say that God causes all things. Rather, this says that God causes all things to work together for good. Now, all things are not good. But God causes all things, both good and bad, to work together for good. Now, this is to say God harmonizes all things together for the ultimate good of believers and for the ultimate purpose of His glory. Note the, word, the verb work, that God causes all things to work. This word work is in the present tense, and it is in the active voice, which means, and this is an important distinction, which means that God is always and continually at work. God is never inactive. God is never a mere spectator. God is always actively causing all things to work together for our good. There is this continual activity of God causing all things to work together for good. Now, if God is causing all things to work together for good, uh, this must include both good things and bad things. Uh, this must include both big things and small things, both God-honoring things and God-dishonoring things both godly things and ungodly things. This is as wide as all things. There is nothing outside of all things. Now, obviously, God causes good things to work together for good. That doesn't take much uh, insight to, to accept that, that God causes good things to work together for good. But let's begin at that most basic point. God causes His Word to work together for good, doesn't He? Uh, Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my Word be which goes forth from my mouth. It shall not, it shall not, it shall not return to me void without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. God is always at work through His Word working for good. God causes prayer to work together for good. James 5 verse 16 says, The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Listen, God hears our prayers, and according to His perfect wisdom, God answers our prayers. And God causes our prayers to work for good. God causes other good things to work together for good. Things like our fellowship and our worship 
and coming to the Lord's table and ministry and serving the Lord and sharing the gospel. God causes all of these good things to work together for good. So that's the most basic entry-level statement uh, for us to begin with. Now, second, to add to that further, God causes seemingly neutral or innocent things to work for our good, things that are amoral, not morally good nor morally evil. They're just amoral things, Uh, things like the change in the weather that may cause us to alter our schedule, or a traffic, traffic accident that causes us to miss a meeting, or a seemingly random running into a person that you did not expect to see. It's not good or evil, it's just amoral, and it may even be a a, a small thing, a relatively insignificant thing, the, the changing of a traffic light whereby I miss going through, and now I am, for whatever reason, 60 minutes or here in Mobile, five minutes longer to get to where I'm supposed to be. And what is more, God causes even the difficult things in our lives to work together for good. Trials, the loss of a job, suffering, persecution, the loss of a relationship, sickness, the loss of health, uh, cancer. God causes even these difficulties of adversity in our lives to work together for good. And moreover, and this is what is so astonishing about our God, is that God also causes evil things to work together for our good. God causes things like sin, even my sin or the sin of others, ultimately to work together for good. He causes Satan to work together for good. He causes his demons to work together for good. And God causes even death itself to work together for good. All things work together by the overruling sovereignty of God for our good. In no way does this remove our human responsibility. In no way does this invite any fatalism at all. What this should do, in fact, is to peak our responsibility and to increase our sense of active faith in this God who is so at work. But the text very clearly says that He causes all things to work together for good. Now, all things is all things. And we point out some of the all things later in this chapter. Uh, The rest of this chapter details some of these all things. Look at verse 35, Romans 8 and and verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? That's quite a a cluster of, uh, of, of difficulties that come against the life of a believer question. Do all these things work together for good? Answer, according to verse 28, yes, verily, amen. Now, look at verse 36, just as it is written. For your sake we are being put to death all day long. That's, in essence, the worst thing that could ever happen to me the worst thing that could ever happen to you. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. It's not merely death. It's death by martyrdom. Do these things work together for our good? The answer, according to verse 28, is yes. Even death and being put to death by slaughter. Look at verse 37. But in all these things... We overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. And the only way that we ultimately overwhelmingly conquer 
is to understand that He causes all things to work together for our good, that we do not live in a defeated mode, but that there is a dynamic sense of triumph and victory about our lives as we move forward by faith, that God is causing it all to work together for our good. Oh, look at verse 38 and verse 39. Again, just to see how expansive and how inclusive is all things. For I am convinced, and that is like saying, and I know. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come. And by the way, those cover everything. There's nothing outside of death and life, all right? That's like saying preach the word in season and out of season. Well, there is no other season. If it's not in season or out of season, that means to always preach the word. And here, when he says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, there is no third option. You're either dead or you're alive. Nor angels, nor principalities. Now look at this one. Nor things present, nor things to come. That covers the field. There's nothing else in your life other than what's going on right now and what will go on forever in your future nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. In Paul's genius mind, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he tries to push the fence out as far as it will go in his thinking, and what he is saying, all things, height, depth, breadth, length, life, death, present, future, anything and everything. And all of this tucks into verse 28. All of this is compressed down and fits into the all things of verse 28. Now, if that is not enough, fast forward just for a moment to to chapter 11, the last verse, verse 36, which is the, the, the end of this section. And in Romans 11, verse 36, Paul takes up again these two words, all things, to show how inclusive is the sovereignty of God over every circumstance of life and death, time and eternity. So, look at verse, Romans 11, verse 36. For from Him, and through Him, and to Him are, now note the two words, All things, the very same words he uses in Romans 8, verse 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for our good. And at the end of this, he says, to him be the glory forever, amen. Look at Romans 11, 36, one more time. From him is the source, through him is the means, and to him is the goal or the purpose. That that covers the field. There is nothing outside of, from Him, through Him, to Him, are all things. That is a a self-inclusive statement that there is no reality outside of it other than God Himself. Uh, Look at it again another way. The Reformation Study Bible states it this way. From Him is God's sovereign will. Through Him is God's sovereign activity. To Him is God's sovereign glory. And what this is saying is there is nothing that ever occurs in your life but that God is working and causing it to work for a higher good and purpose. There is nothing that will ever occur in your life even bad things, even bad decisions that you have made, but that God, who is sovereign over all, can take even the bad things in your life and to work them together for His good, for His glory, and for our good. Now, this leads to number three, the great purpose. We have seen the great certainty and the great activity, our certainty in God's activity, harmonizing all things perfectly together 
Now I want you to see the great purpose. It's these two words in the middle of verse 28, for good. Do you see that? Now, if we do not understand what the purpose is, what the target is, again, we will become frustrated, we will be panicked, we will be subject to great discouragement and great disillusionment and great defeat in our own personal lives. Only as we know what is this good will we be able to overwhelmingly conquer through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good. Question, what is this good? Is it health? Is it wealth? Is it success? Is it a promotion at work? Is it a steady job? Is it financial good? Is it vocational good? Is it career good? Is it family good? Well, this good is defined for us in this text. We don't have to speculate. We know what this greater good is, what this ultimate good is that is far greater than any temporal thing in this world. Look at the next verse, verse 29. Verse 29 is, gives to us the great purpose behind God's working all things together for good in my life. Notice verse 29. For those whom he pre, uh, for whom he foreknew, and, and notice how the, the sentence even begins with the word "for," which means it's an it's an explanation of the previous verse. Verse twenty nine is the explanation of verse twenty eight. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. That is the purpose. It is to conform us into the image of God's Son. In fact, this is the purpose that God has predestined for our lives. And if it's predestined, that means it had to be His purpose before our destiny even began. This is God's eternal purpose, which He had for us before the foundation of the world. Otherwise, it could not be predestined. It couldn't be a predestined purpose, except it be that from before the destiny or the journey began. Before time began, in eternity past, God chose us to be His own. It is the doctrine of election. And when God chose us to be His own, He chose us for the great purpose that we would be conformed to the image of His Son. This would bring great glory to the Lord Jesus Christ that heaven would be populated with people that look like Him, talk like Him, and resemble Him. Imitation is the greatest form of flattery, we say. That heaven would be populated with people who bear the resemblance of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know these five words in, uh, in verses 29 and 30. For new, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. These are known as the five golden links in God's chain of salvation. It begins in eternity past with foreknew. It concludes in eternity future with glorified. And this is really the closest we come to an ordo salutis, an order of salvation that is given to us in Scripture. It begins with those whom He foreknew. Now, the word foreknew does not mean foresight. If anyone here today assumes that the word foreknowledge means foresight, meaning God looking down the tunnel of time to see what God would do in regards to something, you have totally misunderstood the Word of God in your English Bible. The word foreknew means whom God previously 
foreloved, whom God previously set his heart upon in distinguishing love. To know someone is to love someone. And time does not permit me to trace this out in Scripture, but I can think of a few verses. Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and gave birth. For a husband to know his wife means to be in the most intimate relationship that there is on the earth. We read in Matthew 1, verse 21, that Mary was kept uh, a virgin. Literally in the Greek, it doesn't even read that way. Literally in the Greek, it reads, Mary did not know a man. Uh, you remember in Matthew 7, Jesus said, uh, of those who will say, Lord, Lord, he will say, depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never, I never knew you. Now, he knows everything. He knows all about every one of us. He knows the very hairs of our head. But there is a difference between God knowing about someone and God actually knowing someone. The word know means to enter into the most intimate, personal love relationship. That's why in John chapter 10, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. He doesn't know the goats, but he knows the sheep. When we come here to foreknowledge, it has nothing to do. Notice it doesn't say what he foresaw. It says whom he foreknew. God is not foreseeing events. God is foreknowing individuals. That's what the text says. And it is synonymous with the doctrine of election. God's sovereign choice before time of those whom he would set his distinguishing love upon them. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And those whom he foreknew, he predestined. And predestined means that the destination is determined before the journey begins. Those of us today who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it was predestined that we would believe in Him. Let us give glory to God for this. That He is the author of our salvation start to finish. And the way that became real in our lives is the third link. He says, those whom He foreknew, He predestined, and whom He predestined, He called. This is the effectual call of God. It is an irresistible summons, an overpowering drawing by which the Holy Spirit overcame our resistance, and in the day of His power, He drew us to Himself, that we would believe upon Him. And the moment that we believed upon Him as a result of His sovereign calling, He justified us, this says. That means He imputed the perfect active and passive obedience of Christ to our account, and the righteousness of Christ was reckoned or deposited into our account in heaven as though we have lived a sinless and perfect life just as Jesus did. Now, the fifth and final stage of this is glorified. Please note it's in the past tense. Although the reality has not yet come for the Romans to whom Paul is writing, it is so certain, it is so sure that no believer will ever fall from grace. Heaven is spoken of in the past tense, that we will be glorified. Now, glorified means that we will be perfectly made in the image of Jesus Christ. To be glorified means that the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ will be in us and there will be no sin nature within us. Our sinful flesh will be eradicated. Only the new man will be left behind. And then we will be glorified and we will be made fully in the likeness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now you may say, so where is sanctification in all of this? Foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification. 
seems to have passed over sanctification. Where is that? Well, that is in verse 29. And this is the purpose, the great purpose, for which God within time is causing all things to work together for our good. Our good is conformity to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what verse 29 says. And this is God's relentless sovereign activity every moment of every day in our lives. In fact, the verb conformed is also in the present tense. That tells us this is a process. It's not a one-time act. It is an ongoing process throughout the entirety of our lives. It is a lifelong process. As long as we are here upon the earth, we will be being continually conformed into the image of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then one day when we stand before Him in heaven, sanctification will be brought to its final perfect stage, which is glorification. So here's the question. What is God up to in your life? What is the driving purpose for God in your life? Now, we may answer with secondary purposes uh, to help me find the right person to get married, uh, to have healthy kids, uh, to have a better job, uh, to graduate from college. At best, all of those are secondary. Those are the things that we become preoccupied with. But they are at best secondary. In fact, they're not even mentioned in this passage. What is primary, what is essential, what is ultimate, our good, our greatest good, is being conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we would think more and more like Christ. We would have a renewed mind. That we would have a, a heart to, of compassion and, and not only see but respond to things as Jesus does and as the act of my will... I would choose obedience to the Father even as Jesus did. Do you see the great purpose? Now, God is so wise and God is so brilliant in the carrying out of His affairs, God knows that if He gave us all prosperity, we would be worthless. The Father that gives to His Son everything that He would ever desire is certain to produce a worthless Son. A worthless Son. And so God withholds all prosperity and sometimes gives us adversity and trials and tribulation. Just as the rest of Romans... Uh, layered out for us in order for the greater good for us to be, be, be becoming sanctified and growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're being conformed, it means that we've not yet arrived. If we're being conformed, it means there are things that are being removed from our lives while other things are being developed in our lives. This is the great purpose. It is to become like Jesus Christ. It is to grow in Christ's likeness. It is to become like God's Son. It is to bear conformity to Him. That is why when we read verses like James 1, verse 2, we read this. Consider it all joy, my brethren. Not some joy, not a little joy, but consider it all joy. When you encounter, and the word encounter means to fall into something even unexpectedly. The word was used in the parable of the Good Samaritan of the man who was on the road uh, and fell among robbers. Unexpected. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various. The word various means multicolored, like Joseph's... Coat, coat of many colors, meaning trials come in all different shapes and colors, do they not? I mean, there's financial trials, there are marital trials, 
Uh, there are physical trials. Uh, there, there, are all, there are all kinds of trials. Now hear this verse again. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Trials are the testing of our faith. It involves suffering and affliction and painful experiences in life. And you know what? There's not a one of us here today who are exempt from this. Not a one of us. They just come in different shapes and in different forms. There's no house here today without some sorrow. Now James 1, 3 goes on to say, knowing. Again, that's what Paul said. And we know. James says, knowing. That the testing of your faith. That's what trials are all about. They are the testing of our faith. They are like pop quizzes in life to see how you're doing, where your hope is, where your focus is, as well as to cultivate and develop a more singular trust in God, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, this word for endurance means patiently enduring trials as a result of an inner quality of strength. You know, when we go through trials, our most normal response is to want to give up, to want to run away, to want to get out of the trial, to get out of the trouble. And what God says He's doing is that He is bringing trials into our lives, and if we will hang in there and keep our eyes on the Lord, it will produce endurance. The Christian life is not a series of 100-yard dashes. When I used to run track, we would run the straightaways and walk the curves. Run the straightaways, walk the curves, just so you can keep building up endurance. But the Christian life isn't run like that. It's not a series of 100-yard dashes. It's a long obedience in the same direction. It's It's a marathon, if you will. And we must keep on pressing on and running the race that God has set before us. And it the trials or almost like having leg weights put on us, or like hurdles in front of us, or the wind blowing against us. It's all God's design to build up our our strength, our inner strength, to build up our endurance. And let endurance, verse 4, have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect. Now the word perfect needs, I think, a better translation. Mature so that you may be brought to spiritual maturity, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is the great purpose that God has for our lives. And He is causing all things, good things, bad things, big things, small things, prosperity, adversity. God is so so involved and so constantly working that He is working in and through all of these things for good. Not for bad, but for good. To conform us more and more into the image of His Son. Do you see what God's up to? Do you see what is God's primary purpose in your life? Listen, where you work and who you marry, and those things are really secondary. They're important, but they're secondary to what's far more primary, which is to make us like Jesus Christ. May I give you one example from the Scripture? Is this not what we see in the life of Joseph? In Genesis 37 through 50, Joseph's story shows how God sovereignly controls circumstances for our good. Now, you recall the story how Joseph was favored by his father and it caused jealousy among his brothers, and perhaps rightly so. But nevertheless, there was the sinful attitude of jealousy within them that there should not have been. And so they conspired against Joseph, their their brother, and they threw him into a well. They threw him into a dry cistern to leave him there to die. And you remember how there was a caravan of Midianite travelers, merchants who were passing by, and the brothers with carnal desire thought, well, Dad may even find him at the bottom of the well one day. 
the evidence will be against us. So to get rid of the evidence, they sold Joseph for a price to these Midianite travelers just so that they would take him on to Egypt. And they could say to their dad, I don't know, we haven't seen him in a while. And even get money out of the deal. You talk about bad. You talk about an evil motive and, and evil actions that brothers would conspire against one of their brothers and sell him into slavery. That's what it was. It was slavery. After they had tried to put him to death down in a, in a well. And so the Midianite travelers, they sell him to one, uh, 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 an upstanding officer in Egypt, to Potiphar. And there... Joseph suffers all kinds of persecution and all kinds of, of uh, adversity for his faith. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him and draw him into immorality, and he had to flee, and it was turned against him, and he was thrown into prison. He's 17 years old. He is thrown into prison in Egypt, and he's thinking, I'm never going to get out of this alive. And you know the rest of the story, how Joseph became second in charge in Egypt. And one day, during a famine, Joseph's brothers came down to Egypt to look for food. And when they looked up, they saw little brother. And little brother is now ruler next to Pharaoh over Egypt. Now, if I had been little brother... I would have read the riot act to my brothers. Look what you've done to me. Listen to what Joseph said. Joseph is a better theologian than most of us here today. Joseph said to his brothers, after they had done all this evil to him, now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves. He's trying to encourage them. Now, the only way to encourage them is with the truth of the sovereignty of God over the circumstances of life. Now, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for... This is so good. For God sent me before you to preserve life. He said, you know how I got here? God sent me here. You were just the filthy, foul instruments in the hand of a holy God. But over it all was the sovereignty of God. It was God who sent me here. And then in Genesis 45, verse 7, he repeats it, God sent me before you. When we come to the end of the book of Genesis, Genesis 50, verse 20, is this, is this home run verse, is this bell ringer verse. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Now, those were the evil decisions of evil brothers with evil motives to do their brother in. Have you ever been subject to evil decisions that others have made against you? I have. And if you don't believe that God is sovereign, you will absolutely end up in the fetal position in life. Reciting the Greek alphabet backwards. You will, you will go emotionally, mentally insane if you tried to retrace every step in your life and what would have happened if this hadn't happened and what people have tried to done, do to you. And if you had only not done this, you would not have been subject to their rotten, filthy, evil decisions. We must say with Joseph, let me make this more personal, you must say with God, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. That is how sovereign God is. That is how all in control God is. God draws a straight line with a crooked stick. And even the evil that befalls us, God takes it and translates it and harmonizes it into good now, that good may not necessarily mean 
that we become the President of the United States and we become the richest person who ever lived and we have 12 perfectly healthy, brilliant children. But it does mean this, and I tell you this on the authority of the Word of God, and I leave it with you. It does mean that God will be carrying out His purposes of good in your life, which are far higher than health and wealth. It is that you would be conformed into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, and there is no greater agenda for your life than that. And that is why God in His wisdom does not give us all health and all wealth, why God does not give us a free pass in life as the health, wealth, prosperity lies would have us believe, but that God uses even bad things and evil things and trials and tribulation and even death itself in order to bring about our spiritual maturity and grow us up in the Lord and to take us to the next level of spiritual development. And by the way, while we're talking about this, is this not but what God did at the cross? It was at the hands of evil men that they put Jesus to death, but God worked it for good. And not because God was left with this. This was God's original sovereign plan A purpose according to His predetermined plan and foreknowledge, yet God caused evil men to praise Him. God caused evil men to carry out His perfect plan for human history, which has brought the greatest good that has ever come to your life, the forgiveness of sin. Think of the evil atrocities of Calvary. It was first-degree, cold-blooded murder. Let's call it for what it is. And God took the grossest murder in the history of mankind, the crucifixion of His own beloved Son, and it is a rock that has opened up where there are streams of living water that have come gushing into your life. And it was the result of that evil, heinous, satanic, demonic, devilish crucifixion of the only sinless man who has ever lived on the earth, the very eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has worked it all for good, for the greatest good that has ever come to your life. Listen, in an argument from the greater to the lesser, if God did that at Calvary, don't you think He does that in your office tomorrow morning? If God has done that at the cross to bring blessing for the ages. Don't you think that God can do this in your life this week in the relatively small issues that are before you? It's an argument from the greater to the lesser. I must conclude, lest this become a series. Let me show you the end of verse 28. I heard your nervous laugh. I want you to see the great calling. And I've really already discussed this. The great calling to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Please note for whom this promise is realized. In whom this promise is realized. This is reserved for Christians only. God is a discriminating God. This is reserved for Christians only. All things do not work together for all people. This does not apply to everyone. It is only for those who are true, born-again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we have here is the heads and tails of the same coin. There is a twofold description of one and the same person. One is on the human side, the other is on the divine side. On the human side, believers are those who love God. On the divine side, believers are those who are called according to His purpose. There you have it. The, the human side is we love God. And everyone in the world either loves God or hates God. There's no one who's just indifferent to God whether by active rebellion or in indifferent indecisiveness, every unbeliever is a God-hater. That's why if you had a seeker-sensitive service and you were dependent upon sinners to show up, no one would show up. 
God is the seeker. Those who love God are those who have been sovereignly, effectually, irresistibly called by God to love Him. This is an extraordinary statement of, of divine sovereignty. Please note that saving faith here is not mere intellectual knowledge of some facts about the Bible. The genuine Christian is one who loves God. It goes further than just knowing with the mind the facts of the gospel. There is in the heart a, a passionate love for God. That's when conversion is real. It's when you suddenly hate your sin and you love God. Uh, you hate your self-righteousness. You hate your self-centeredness. Uh, you hate your pursuit of sin in this world. In fact, you hate this evil world system, and you now love God, and you love His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the word conversion means, that everything is turned around. You are converted. But the only way that could ever happen is by sovereign grace. The only way this could ever happen is by sovereign regeneration, by sovereign calling. And that is what the end of the verse says, to those who are called according to to His purpose. So let us be encouraged today. This great promise. God is always at work in our lives. Right now, God is present tense at work in your life. And God is at work in your life not for bad, but for good. He is at work for your greatest good. God is at work for your ultimate good. God is for you. God is with you. God is working right now for your good. He is using good things for good. He is using bad things for good. He is using all things for good. Do you see this? Do you see this in God's Word? This is what God is doing in your life. And even temporal defeats and temporal setbacks, God is working for good. In 1555, Queen Mary, otherwise known as Bloody Mary, began her assault upon the Protestant believers in England. I have at the front of my Bible the first man burned at the stake, John Rogers, in 1555. One faithful preacher was named Bernard Gilpin, and he was accused of preaching the gospel. That was his crime, preaching salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and he suffered a heresy trial in which he was found to be guilty, guilty by Bishop Boner. And he was sentenced to go to London to be burned at the stake publicly before the watching eyes of the aristocrats of London. And this brother, Gilpin, said, in response, all things work together for good. As they were taking him in route, those who were his captors began to taunt him with that verse. So is everything working out for good in your life right now, as we will set you aflame and burn you to death? And he said, yes, for my Bible says so. In route, he broke his leg. And his captors heaped mockery on him. They had to stop. And for some short period of time, for his leg to be reset before he could continue the journey. And by the time he reached London, Bloody Mary had been removed from the throne. And he was never executed. He could have complained about that broken leg. 
But if he had seen the big picture, he would have raised up to the heights of heaven and kissed the clouds and said, God, thank you for that broken leg. Because it was by this broken leg that my execution was delayed and you have spared my life. I wonder what there is in your life today that is the equivalent of the broken leg. That as you see it in your life, it is a source of great despondency and source of great discouragement as you would doubt that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. If you could but pull back the veil and see what all that God is doing, you would say, for I know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. Let us all be mature believers. Let us all be grown up in our faith. Let us no longer be children. Let us see as God sees, and let us know with deep certainty what Paul states, that God is always at work causing all things to work together for good. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the good that you are bringing about in our lives. And I pray that you would open our eyes that we might see all the more fully. In Jesus' name, amen. Because of the time and that I have preached a little longer, rather than us closing with a hymn, I would like to ask the ushers to come, if you would come for the offering. And if Susan and the instruments would play during the offering, then we will be soon dismissed. Father, as we now take this offering, etch it into our minds, put it down deep into our souls, that you are causing all things to work together for good. In Jesus' name, amen.